proceed with an update from the Department of Human Services on opioid treatment uh, programs. With us today we have um, the Deputy Director of Substance Use Disorder Services from the Minnesota Department of Human Services. If you'd please uh, introduce yourself and proceed with your update. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Jen Saylor. As you identified, I'm the Deputy Director of Substance Use Disorder Services for the Department of Human Services, and I'm here to talk a little bit about opioid treatment programs today. If they're not, Mr. Chair, if I could, Ms. Saylor, if you can get closer, I can hardly hear. Thank you. So I thought about starting with just a little bit about what is an opioid treatment program. Um, and so for those of you who don't know, an opioid treatment program is one that specializes um, in serving clients with opioid use disorder. The primary role of an OTP is medication along with counseling. Currently, OTPs utilize three FDA approved forms of medication uh, for individuals with OUD. Uh, that would be methadone, buprenorphine products, and uh, naltrexone. Additionally, uh, something that I think makes OTPs a little unique is the multiple regulatory bodies that oversee them. So they are overseen by the state of Minnesota, DEA, SAMHSA, and then an accreditation body similar to JCO or CARF. In the state of Minnesota, there are currently 18 licensed and funded OTPs. One is a hospital-based and 17 are non-residential programs. They serve, uh, as of Friday, they were serving a little over 6,200 individuals with a capacity of 7,500 individuals. Uh, it is important to know that um, capacity is completely based on staffing. So if they lose staff members, um, that reduces their capacity to serve. And this is updated weekly, so we are able to keep a track of what, what the capacity is in the state every week. Um, additionally, one cool thing about Minnesota is that we have a central registry, and so we have clients that as soon as they come in and admit to an OTP, get added to the centralized registry. It allows for, um, or I should say prevents, individuals from being enrolled or admitted to multiple OTP programs, so they're only able to be admitted to one OTP at a time. So there have been some federal changes um, that will impact the OTPs in Minnesota. The effective date of these changes is April 1st, or April 2nd, excuse me, of this year, um, and they need to be implemented by October 2nd of this year. Uh, one of the kind of first larger changes is that the minimum dose is now raised from 30 milligrams to 50 milligrams. This is in response to the opioid epidemic that we're seeing and the fact that um, substances as we know them are, are stronger. Um, additionally, they are codifying into law um, some of the COVID variances that uh, reduce the timelines that it takes for individuals to be able to take home doses. Uh, so individuals normally have to come into the clinic to dose. This vari variance would allow, or this permanent law would allow them to take those, home, those doses home with them and dose at home. Um, a really great step in the right direction is it will be removing the requirement that you have to have two failed attempts at an abstinence-based program for any minor to admit to an OTP program. So it'll eliminate that barrier to care. Um, telehealth will now be permanent. And then um, kind of last and definitely not least is uh, we, they will be aligning more with ASAM terminology. So instead of using terms like detox, we'll be hearing terms withdrawal management. Um, over the course of the summer, we uh, conducted an OTP work group. Uh, this was in result of legislation that passed last session. Uh, it included six meetings and a representative from each OTP was invited to be involved. The discussion really looked at five major areas, uh, regulatory oversight, increasing access to OTPs, geographic distances, racial barriers, and justice involved clients. Some of the issues that were identified in this work group that are currently facing Minnesota, so the incongruence between state and federal law, similar to what I had mentioned earlier, there are a bunch of federal changes that just occurred. Uh, the reimbursement rate for um, OTPs 
workforce shortage, um, not only counseling staff, but also medical staff for these programs, uh, the paperwork burden, and then the uh, lack of availability of methadone that would be either in a mobile unit or uh, remote dispensing sites. Some of the uh, recommendations that the work group came up with uh, would be aligning state and federal regu regulations, really ensuring that um, we are in line with what, um, what the federal government is suggesting or requiring. Um, increasing the dose level um, above the 150 milligram maximum. Uh, currently in the state, if uh, someone is at 150 milligrams and they wish to be increased or they need to be increased, uh, they are required to have a face-to-face -face meeting with the medical practitioner um, prior to this increase happening. Again, with the um, increase in, in fentanyl and xylazine in the drug supply, we are seeing the need for higher and higher doses. Um, another recommendation would be revised documentation reviews and updates um, for individuals who are on stable doses of methadone and have been for a very long time. Uh, their documentation is the same or similar as to someone who has been in the program six months. And so really identifying what's the clinical need for the documentation based off of uh, the individual themselves. The last three recommendations um, are, again, ways to reduce barriers to care. Um, and so one of those is to re re remove the requirement that um, individuals must have a government-issued photo ID in order to admit to the program. Um, secondly, uh, not adding requirements that would require an OTP to enter clients' information into the prescription drug monitoring program. Uh, this really has impact to individuals when they seek care outside of the OTP. And then lastly, um, permitting OTPs to be eligible for um, alternative licensing inspections. So again, as I said before, they are DEA um, overseen and CAR for Joint Commission accredited. And so alternative licensing inspections would be something similar to what we see for some of our 245G programs. So that is my really brief update on OTPs. Please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Deputy Director. Uh, members, do we have any questions today on the opioid treatment program update? Senator Aki. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, question, and it's from the last page, uh, and if you had covered this earlier, I apologize, um, but when it talks about removing the uh, requirement of a government-issued photo ID card. Why would that be and wouldn't that be required? I mean, a lot of these are probably um, the care is being paid for by Medicaid. Um, how would we know the person is who they are uh, without that? Um, I mean, this seems like something we'd want to continue. Deputy Director. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so ultimately, um, since folks are vetted through the government via medical assistance and the Behavioral Health Fund, um, the belief and the request from the OTPs would be to do away with the government ID. Um, they would be known who they are by the medical assistance they're receiving. Senator Rucky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we would <clears throat> fully know who they are and be able to collect the appropriate uh, payments or issue the appropriate uh, reimbursements? Deputy Director. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Correct. Thank you, Senator Aki. Do we have any other member questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Deputy Director, for the update. Um, I also want to say we do have a, a quorum, so a quorum, a quorum is present. Next on the agenda is Senator Hoffman's Senate File 4478. Senator Hoffman, the bill is before the committee, and I see you have an author's amendment. Yeah, Mr. Chair and members, thank you. The, I believe it's an A1, be an A1 amendment. Just some, uh, we needed some work on it, 
insert word voting, delete child, and insert person voting of the commission. It's just some technical changes there, Mr. Chair. I move that. Move the A1. Thank, thank you, uh, Senator Hoffman. Uh, the A1 amendment and author's amendment is before the committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. The amendment is adopted. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Hoffman, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. That amendment really was our nonpartisan research, got that bill into the shape that it needs to be. So it kind of, it lined the corn cans up with the corn buckets. So I just wanted to make sure we were all about aligning things up in this committee. Um, the Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, they, they're overseen by the governor appointed board and that develops um, uh, and advocates for public policies for and with 20% of Minnesotans who have a hearing loss. And um, what you have in front of you, the bill will update Minnesota Statute 256C.28 to better align with the qualifications needed to serve on the board um, for the Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. Uh, with this bill, there's two, three things that we aim to do is to, as required by statute, fill 50% of its voting seats with qualified candidates who have a lived experience of deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing Minnesotans that we serve. And I think that's important. More efficiently, um, we convey to state policymakers and administrators the information necessary to make decisions that protect and promote quality of life. That's the second one. The third one is to maintain a balance of experience and new members by bringing back the experienced members as needed. There are several testifiers, D Dr. Uh, Darlene Zangara, who used to be with the Olmstead group, now she's the uh, director of the Minnesota Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, Hard of Hearing, and then John Fetcher is a board member, and I think that's all I have of those two for you, Mr. Chair. So, Darlene, you wanna come? Thank you. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Dr. Zangara, um, welcome to the committee, and uh, please uh, state your name and uh, position for the testimony and proceed with your testimony. Yes, thank you, Chair, Senator. I am Dr. Darlene Zangara. I'm the Executive Director for the Minnesota Commission of Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing. I appreciate to be able to be here to give my testimony today. This is regarding support of SF4478. As you already heard from Senator Hoffman, the commission is over, there's a governor appointed board that oversees the commission and develops advocacy for public policy. And for 20% of Minnesotans who have a hearing loss. Our current statute ensures that the commission board can fill at least 50% of its voting seats with qualified candidates who have, as Senator Hoffman said, have lived experience of being deaf, deaf, blind, or hard of hearing. And it allows the commission to become more efficient to ensure that the state policymakers and administrators have the information necessary to make decisions that will protect protect and promote the quality of life for those deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing Minnesotans. We are asking for your support on three issues to remove the outdated requirements that actually work against the goal of that 50% voting representation. One example is the requirement to have three parents. In the statute it says, one parent of each group, deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing. Secondly, the requirement for a human services representative. 
Decades ago, deaf and hard of hearing people often pursued careers in human services due to the limited selection of careers that were accessible to, him, to them. Today, there are more options and less of deaf and hard of hearing folks going into those fields. So keeping that language will restrict the number of qualified people to serve on the board. Also adding ex officio positions to strengthen our connections with state agencies who serve deaf, deaf, blind, and hard of hearing Minnesotans. And this is in line with practices of other state councils. Thirdly, we want to create flexibility in total time served to ensure that we have a balance of experienced members and new members. These recommendations have been discussed in open and public commission board meetings since 2022. We've also hosted annual information, informational Q&A legislative agenda meetings. And these proposed changes and rationales are in our publicly posted board meeting archives, as well as in our legislative section in our website. The organization is only as good as the makeup of the board. I want to remove the stress and the inflexibility of recruiting outstanding, diverse members of our communities. We are consistently challenged with keeping our seats filled with talented and contributing citizens of Minnesota. Thank you. Is John, is John coming to Fetcher, is he? John Fetcher is our vice chair of the commission and also a committee member of the recruitment and training committee. He, unfortunately, he's ill today. Okay. Uh, so I could summarize some of his talking points from his planned testimony, or we could give the written to you. Mr. Chair, what would you like? Thank you, Dr. Zangara, for your testimony. I believe that Mr. Fletcher is providing written testimony to the committee for their consideration. Um, do we have any member questions or discussion? Seeing none, uh, Senator Hoffman, it's, uh, would you please provide uh, closing remarks? And it's my understanding that you would like this bill to go to state and local government today. Yep. As amended, yes, Mr. Chair. I just want to say thank you. Um, the work they're doing is, is really beneficial on behalf of Minnesota. And, and with that, I'd like to do uh, um, Senate File 4478. Mr. Chair, as amended, be recommended to pass and referred to state and local government and veterans committee. That's correct. Thank you. On that motion, all in favor, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. With that, uh, the, the motion passes and Senate file 4478 is recommended to pass and is re-referred to state and local government and veterans committee. Thank you, Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene. Thank you. Thank you. I think Senator Fate is up next, right? Members, Senator Fate, you got Senate file 0792. Imagine that when we only had only 792 bills were introduced. I think what are we at, like 18,000 or something right now? So um, that, this is your continue uh, continuity of care requirements for seniors receiving personal assistance under Medicaid, right, in managed care. Senator Fate, I think you want this one to go from here to Health and Human Services, is that correct? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. The floor is yours, Senator Fate. Thank you, welcome to the, welcome to the committee. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, committee members. Uh, SF-792 was brought to me by the Minnesota First Provider Alliance, uh, the statewide association of personal care assistance agencies. Uh, the bill attempts to address uh, a growing problem for individuals with disabilities who, upon turning 65, 
may be forced to leave their longtime PCA providers because of insurance network limitations. Under current law, PCA services for individuals with disabilities under age 65 are paid directly by DHS in a fee-for-service model. This means that individuals receiving services can choose to work with any agency enrolled with DHS to provide PCA services. However, when they turn 65, their PCA services are incorporated into managed care and they can only receive services from an agency that has a contract with their MCO. This means that some individuals with disabilities are forced to change PCA agencies when they turn 65. Often, they have worked with the agency and staff for years or even decades. Not only does this result in unnecessary administrative hassle for the individual, the county, and DHS, but it also has a disproportionate impact on new Americans and communities of color as it tends to restrict their ability to utilize a culturally specific provider agency. What generally happens when someone turns 65 and is using a PCA agency that does not have a contract with their MCO is that the MCO will offer a limited contract, often 60 to 90 days, for just that person's PCA services. This bill would simply require that such a contract be offered for an indefinite period of time. This bill does not open the MCO's network for all clients of the PCA as it is limited to that individual. This also does not prevent the MCO from investigating and if, and, and if appropriate, terminating the contract of that agency if they find violations or other issues. It simply requires that the individual specific contracts of the MCOs already used to facilitate these transitions uh, be offered in an ongoing manner. I have Pang Vang, the treasurer of the Minnesota First Provider Alliance here with me to provide more details and help answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Senator. Do you have an A2, you wanna do your A2 amendment or did you, do you want to, you got an amendment, you got an A2? No? There's an A2 in the packet. The answer is yes, I'm seeing somebody, former committee administrator. <laughs> so. Uh, here it comes. Yeah. Dan, you know what that's all about? You wanna? No, we got. So how about those Iowa Hawkeyes? Did you guys watch that? Forget it. That was funny. Wasn't that great basketball? Unbelievable. What a nail biter. That's old school. It was like 54 points in the paint. I mean, that just doesn't happen anymore. It was. Oh. All right. Senator Fate, do you want to? The A2. Is the A2? I think so. That's what my notes say. Yeah, it's A2. I got I somebody like in the back of the room saying yes. Mr. Chair, I like to move the A2. Do you know what the A2 is about? It's the technical changes, but you can point okay. to Okay, it's some sure technical you. changes in there. Uh, we're good on the A2, everybody? So be it. The A2 amendment, uh, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Senator Fate, now that the bill is in the form that you want it, go ahead. Pang Vang, welcome back to the committee. You want to... Tell us a little bit about Rainbow Healthcare and Minnesota Provider First Alliance and, and this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair um, and committee members. I, uh, my name is Pang Vang. I'm with um, Rainbow Healthcare Inc. and the Minnesota First Provider Alliance. I've been in business for about 20 years in the Twin Cities here. Um, the bill is, uh, he did a really great job, Senator Fate, um, in the outline. The bill is just trying to continue services without being interrupted. A lot of times when I have clients who are um, turning 65, they don't get notification right away which help that they're going into. And then all of a sudden it shows up and then now um, they have, I don't have a contract with an MCO that they're, um, they've been entered with in the county. And so like, for take for instance, 
um, like they went to UCARE as a new member, and now I no longer can keep them as a client. Um, many times, they're not all family members. They are sometimes outside caregivers, and so the caregiver is my caregiver that I have provided higher to this client, and with them moving to a new agency, they might lose this caregiver, and it's really hard right now to hire caregivers and keep them. Um, so many times the client will go to an agency that is in network with the MCO, but then don't have any, doesn't have a caregiver. And so that's what this bill is trying to address. Thank you. And thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Vang. Any questions for the Senator or Ms. Vang? I think that's all I have is uh, Senator Utke is just, I got Peng Vang, um, Senator Fate, Senator Utke, and then Senator Abler. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and as I see it, I, looking at what the amendment does, it doesn't move around a lot. We still have the fact that it's uh, mandating that the MCO, et cetera, pick up that employer, uh, employee, or in this case, agency. Um, and that was the troubling part that I had when I had the bill as an author. Oh. And so I would still have those same concerns. I know that both sides were, had been working on this since last year, um, but it appears that there hasn't been an agreement yet that got rid of that mandate. And so um, that's just still an ongoing concern from me um, that we're forcing some, in this case, uh, the county-based purchasing plan or the managed care organization to take on basically an employee or um, you know, the agency, you know, and in a lot of cases, it's going to be a natural. They're probably going to work, but the fact that it's still mandated is where I had I had challenges with that, and still do. Thank you. So, Senator Fate or Vang Pang, I mean, I, I understand. Thank you for that. The, the mandate, but chances are it'll work, right? Is there? Um, and this was your bill last year, right? Two years ago. We just recently uh, uh, changed. Uh, oh. I was the author, now Senator Fate is. So uh, we put him in a hot seat. Okay. okay. Senator Fate, how are you going to do to fix this? Senator, and then you go to Mr. Senator Bertrand's Abler. You want to go, Mr. Senator Abler, why Dan? Why well, thanks. Well, <clears throat> comes down. well, I think it's a smart mandate. I just wonder if anybody from the Council of Health Plans or anybody here is to tell us why it's so difficult to have continuity with the person who knows the person, instead of getting a stranger that might mess them up and put them in the hospital and cost them even more money. So is that what you're here for, Mr. Bergeron, or are you uh, here for a different purpose? Thank you, Senator Abler. I mean, that's a great thing, continuity care. Is that what we want? I mean, some consistency and, no. and right? Don't, don't we want that? No. no. Matt Bergeron. <laughs> I think I called you Dan when you were sitting back there. I don't have my glasses on. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senators, my name is Matthew Bergeron with the law firm of Larkin Hoffman. I represent the Minnesota First Provider Alliance. Uh, Senator Utke's comment is correct. The, the bill as drafted still requires the offering of that contract, and that was one of the things we've we've worked, and, and Senator Utke did a lot of good work to help us engage with payers in the space that kind of ultimately became the um, kind of the, the end rub on it. However, I think from the, the agency and the consumer perspective, the goal is to ensure that those long, oftentimes long time, um, you know, multi-year, multi-decade uh, re provider relationships, the cultural specificity of the, of the care, the language um, being uh, uh, utilized in the provision of these services is able to be maintained. And it also cuts down on the kind of administrative functions that come with having to, to change because if in the instance where a PCA does follow their client to a different agency, you have to go through both a, a health plan and a DHS uh, reaffiliation process. And so the, the goal is really to try to cut down those administrative um, transitions while ensuring uh, access to the, to the care that the individual has, has chosen and utilized for years. That's the, Mr. Senator Abler. Well, thanks, Mr. Bergeron, for all that. And I think this is a great bill. And I think you've all acquitted yourselves well. I just. Is there nobody in the audience from the health plans that wants to come and I just want to quietly kill it? They're, I just don't understand. I, you know, we, we sit here with ideas that are good. Are you, anybody there? Come on down. Tell us uh, what's wrong. Um, yeah, the next and I respect uh, Senator Upke, the mandate part, but this one is probably free. 
And given the continuity with these people, and I mean, good luck for all the, if, if all the HMOs can tell me when they want to come down and talk to me, that they have plenty of PCAs and direct support people to make sure that everybody's covered. Like, here we got one for this nice person who they've known for 20 years. Mr. Chair, we would not want that. Thank you. I think you just answered the question <laughs> that Senator Utke, you know. Um, I, I like it. I mean, it, the continuity of care is a real, it's a, and, and you're, you're to your point, Senator Abler, I, I'm okay. Where are the HMOs? Send, you want, you know, we, can we just send it to the floor? I mean, that would be, I, I'm kidding. No, this is going to go. Senator uh, Fate, as amended, you want to recommend and pass and, and have it re referred to Health and Human Services. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. So, Senator Fate moves Senate File 792 be recommended to pass and re referred to Health and Human Services Committee. All those in favor say aye. Aye. aye opposed, same sign. <laughs> <laughs> It goes on. How many abstentions do you have on that, Senator Utke? That was funny. This is good stuff. Senator Fate, you got Senate File 4531. Um, looks yes. like you got uh, Ms. Pang Vang is going to join us again for that. Welcome back. This is also a bill I stole from Senator Utke, by the way. And, no, and I have an A1 amendment sitting in here. Is that correct, Senator Fate? One Senator one. Utke? There's one an one. A1 amendment? All right, I got a yep up here. Uh oh. We're good. All those in favor of the A1 amendment say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Senator Fate. I found it, yes. <laughs> it, Thank there you. you go, it's in your order. It's an utkey. Go the good, the bad, and the utkey, right? Isn't that your, that yes. was a comment you made? <laughs> <Was> that? <laughs> That's funny. That is. <laughs> Still my favorite quote from him, Senator Abler, so. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, members, and thank you for the opportunity to present Senate File 4531, a bill that would expand the training options and eliminate barriers for PCAs who support individuals who qualify for the enhanced rate. The enhanced rate has been, placed, has been in place since 2018 and was championed by Senator Abler and the late Senator Ralph. Uh, the intent ha was to reward PCAs who provided care uh, to service recipients who have the highest care needs and to make it easier to recruit workers by offering a higher wage. Service recipients who are assessed to need 10 or more hours of care a day are eligible for the enhanced rate of 7.5% and the agency is able to build that additional 7.5% if the PCI has completed required training. Currently, this training is offered through online modules. This poses barriers to PCAs who struggle or is unable to navigate and access the internet. The online modules are only offered in English, in English uh, which poses significant challenges to PCAs who do not speak English as their first language. Uh, uh, DHS did recently create an, accept, an exception process for PCAs who cannot read English. Additionally, the enhanced rate training requires in-person classes that must be taken in a PCA's free time. This poses barriers to caregivers who live in rural areas, have other jobs, or live with the person receiving services. This bill would eliminate the online training modules and the in-person class requirements. Uh, instead, personal health care providers, the worker training and develop, de development uh, professional, parents, spouses, or even the service recipient themselves could provide the, requ the requisite training that is based on the care needs of the individual uh, to qualify the enhanced rate, to qualify for the enhanced rate. Uh, this change would allow the training to be more individualized to those individuals' care needs and allow more PCAs to qualify for the higher wage. It is important to note that this bill would not eliminate training requirements for PCAs altogether uh, to qualify for the enhanced rate, but instead offer more individualized options for them to do so. The budget already, ex uh, already includes money for those service recipients who qualify at the enhanced rate it just isn't fully accessed because of the barriers that exist within the training. This bill allows for a more person-centered approach and reduces barriers to PCAs who are eligible to qualify for the enhanced rate. And with that, I'll turn it over to my testifier, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Ms. Fang. Um, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for the record again, my name is Peng Vang. I am the treasurer of the Minnesota First Provider Alliance, a statewide membership Association for Personal Care Aid Assistance Providers. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to provide testimony for SF 4531. 
the enhanced rate bill was passed by legislation six years ago, allowing PCAs that work for clients assessed for 12 hours or more per day, and now 10 hours or more per day, to receive a higher reimbursement rate, which means that their PCAs are able to be paid a higher hourly wage. Clients with higher needs are the hardest to find and keep staff. Due to complex needs, such as ventilator-dependent, bowel programs, swallowing disorders, and feeding tubes, all of which can be intimidating for a PCA worker without the proper training. Currently, PCAs are able to take a online training requirement. A portion of the online training requir requires a PCA to answer questions about civil rights and advocacy and the history of the disability rights movement. This process has been confusing, daunting, and irrelevant to the point that some PCAs have simply given up and decided that th this is just too complicated. Right now, the online training in is only available in English. I have to sit with my PCAs and read each test to them. Many of my employees have no access to computers or internet, so I have to schedule time in my office for the training to be completed. The PCA program is the most culturally diverse program. The employees must be able to communicate and with the person they are supporting, which means they don't all speak and certainly don't all read English. It takes double the time to train because I have to translate everything. If the person is not a nurse, a CNA, or a home health aide, they are also required to take an instructor-led first aid or CPR class or a class from a list of trainings. Some caregivers live with the person receiving services and cannot leave the client alone. Others have full-time jobs, so finding time to go and take the in-person class creates an added burden. Most often, the classes also have an associated fee. We are asking that you remove the online training instructor-led training requirement and replace it with training that is specific to the individual needs of the client. This training can be conducted by the qualified professional or worker trainer, a healthcare professional, or the responsible party, or even the person themselves. Currently under traditional PCA, a QP is already required to train and supervise all PCAs. And under the PCA Choice Program, PCAs are trained by the clients or the responsible party. Thank you for letting me testify today. Thank you, Ms. Fang. Um, any questions, members? The fiscal, there'll be a Matt, Elise, there'll be a fiscal note uh, attached to this. You don't know. You don't know anybody? Yes? Yeah. All right. So we'll get that. So I guess we're just going to, we'll lay this one over as amended for possible inclusion. And if you find out if we're going to get any money, buddy, at least you want to come down here? You want to, I'm kidding. Since I can't seem to get Kevin Parker to answer any questions on that, but that's okay. Thank you, Senator Fate. We'll lay this over possible inclusion of the omnibus bill. So Senator Abler Thank you, Senator. is up next. Brian Zerbys, Anderson St. George, Lance Egley, come on down. And you got Kevin Doyle. I think we can get a fourth chair out around there since we're going to have a discussion. Um, do you have some A something amendments to yeah, Senator A? They're all A's because they're that good, Mr. Chair. I love it. Um, <coughs> so it's all this yours. is uh, Senate File 3984. Um, and I would move to A3, and I just want to point out a highlight, a couple of highlights. Um, for the students of the English language on line 1.2, which... Jim, Senator, sorry, we don't have the... We're just passing A3. the A3 uh, out. Yeah, it's just getting handed out I'll now. I'll just uh, tell my little... When Senator Ecke looks at me and says, I don't have it yet, that means it's a... we got to get the thing, so... Exactly. <laughs> well, Mr. Chair, if I may, in the interest of time, explain a couple Go ahead. of salient you can elements of this amendment, which I think make it keenly interesting to the members. On line 1.2, it, it deletes, it inserts a that and strikes a that. So I guess that'd be the that's that amendment. And on the second uh, line 1.3, it capitalizes the joint commission, which <laughs> is an omission of the commission. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. And the rest of it is all amazing. Uh, makes the much a bill even better. And Mr. Liam Monahan has worked night and day uh, on this thing, and I appreciate his expertise. So. Senator Abler moves A3 amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Senator Abler, the, you got another one? Uh, that's all. That's Not it. on this one. The bill's yours. It's in yeah, the... Mr. Chair, this is, uh, we've had heard some good bills today. In the scale of bills you're hearing today, this is probably right at the top. 
Um, and so I've got a small army of testifiers, which they can tell you what the heck it does. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Senator Abler. And I know Kevin Doyle is online too, but he's only there if anybody has any questions. Dr. Doyle is available. So um, Brian Zerbes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, committee members, my name is Brian Zerbis. I'm the executive director of MARCH. Uh, MARCH is a statewide trade association for substance use disorder programs and professionals. Uh, as part of the packet of materials, uh, I submitted a, a slide deck or presentation uh, with the two bills uh, touching on SED policy uh, and the next one on funding. I uh, just wanted to give an overview of, of kind of what's happening in the state regarding substance use disorder. As of a couple days ago, there's 417 licensed SED programs in the state. Uh, in the last two years, uh, the data around the number of programs that have opened in 2022 and 2023 and the number that have closed shows a net reduction in 45 programs. What that means is in the last two years, 116 licenses have closed, 71 have opened. So the net reduction in access points in the state is 45 programs. Within that data, uh, what uh, you will also see is the, uh, there's two programs that closed in the last two years that opened up in the 1970s, five programs opened up in the 1980s. So seven programs are more than 40 years old have closed in the last two years. Uh, adolescent program closures, uh, again, in the last two years, six adolescent focused or adolescent programs have closed. And when you look at the program closure data by county, uh, I compared the seven county metro area with the 80 county uh, greater Minnesota. And in the last two years, just over 40% of all closures are occurring in greater Minnesota. And in 2023, two thirds of all residential programs uh, that closed were in greater Minnesota. Um, the status of the workforce, we recently conducted a statewide survey. We got 627 survey responses back. Um, Three-fourths of the people that responded were direct care people, counselors, nurses, technicians, things like that. Um, and the uh, span of uh, survey respondents covered 137 zip codes in Minnesota. And the one question that really stood out is we asked um, staff, in the last 12 months, if you consider leaving the field, um, just over 50% said yes. And within those uh, people that said yes, uh, about uh, a quarter of them are anticipating to leave the field in the next year. Um, there's additional data that's already been presented to this committee on admissions, uh, overdose death rates in Minnesota, uh, the data around uh, health disparities for American Indians uh, and black Minnesotans with overdose deaths is, is starkly apparent. Um, so the bill in front of you, the 3984, uh, is a policy bill that was developed and I'm gonna give a brief overview of the sections and then pass it over to the testifiers. Um, so the uh, first section is expanding alternative paths to licensure. Uh, this would add uh, master's programs uh, to uh, also be eligible for uh, being licensed. Uh, section two is alternative licensing inspections. It would add uh, two additional uh, national accrediting bodies to be eligible uh, for alternative licensing inspections for programs. Section three and five, uh, both of those uh, touch on ASAM requirements, uh, American Society of Addiction Medicine. Uh, so some components with that, it would be eliminating uh, a term called uh, licensing candidates from this ratio that programs can have more than 50% of your staff be students, uh, interns, uh, former students, or licensing candidates. Uh, it's uh, changing hours and uh, FTE requirements for medical and mental health staffing. Uh, again, with what ASAM looks as, they're not prescriptive with the number of hours or staff you have to have. Uh, you, uh, programs need to meet the requirements um, that are laid out in statute. Uh, there's language regarding residential documentation in that when a program uh, is serving someone in a residential and the uh, client's hours aren't met, that the program can still be paid for the services they're delivering as long as they're documenting the interventions they're doing with the person. Uh, and then also the last piece in that section is re related to having federal holidays off for counselors. Um, section four is uh, regarding a county uh, behavioral health fund affidavit. Uh, so we've worked with uh, MAXA Association on uh, some of the language uh, which is incorporated in the amendment, uh, changing from 10 calendar days to five business days. And the last item is changing the deadline for a paperwork reduction report, which one of our test fires will touch on. So with that, I will conclude and pass off to the next test fire. Thank you, Mr. Zerbes. Any questions for that overview? No? 
Uh, Anderson St. George, welcome to the committee. Thank you, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity um, to share. My name is Anderson St. George. I'm the CEO of Daystar Recovery Center, a 28 beds residential treatment center serving males above 18 and above in rural Minnesota. I'm a member of the Governor's Advisory Council on Opioid Substance Use and Addiction. I'm a board member of the Hazelden Graduate School of Addiction Studies. I am a March board member and the chair of the World Health and Disparities Committee, a subdivision of March, which mission is to identify and document disparities in services in rural Minnesota, determine barriers that cause them, and recommend policies to overcome them. As a result of years of research and data collection, the World Health and Disparities Committee identified three major disparities, housing, transportation, workforce crisis, and as someone who's working directly with uh, providers, I foresee that in the near future, if we don't do anything about um, our current workforce crisis, because treatment centers are closing left and right, we will run into a treatment access disparity in rural Minnesota. Um, Senator Jim Abler, um, February 10, 2022, I testified virtually about the workforce crisis and burnout risk. And today, I'm back here again to talk about the risk of burnout and uh, people leaving the field because they are emotionally drained, experiencing compassion fatigue, et cetera. Um, as a clinician, I encourage my clients to take a holistic approach of recovery um, by taking a biopsychosocial, um, financial, spiritual um, approach of healing. We instill in our clients the importance of self-care, stress management, a balanced living. We teach them to set healthy boundaries and prioritize mental health well-being. Yet, while we teach the important, lesson, the important lessons, the counselors, the program directors, the CEOs, the direct care staff find ourselves grappling with our own exhaustion and inability. I'm gonna keep it really quick, a quick real life story. Um, two weeks ago, I, I reached a breaking point as someone who's running a treatment center, providing close to 20 hours of clinical hours to my clients, and most recently, our intake provider, provider approached me and say, I cannot do this anymore. It's not good for my mental health. I need to step aside because the field is too stressful. And I added his job on my plate where I am taking care of the intake by calling people, trying to bring clients to treatment. And I do also provide transportation, driving 40, 50 miles to go get clients and bring them back to treatment. And one week specifically, we were super busy, and I happened to be on duty that weekend, I mean on call, and we trying to meet um, the expectation of the ASM, and we provide clinical services during the weekend now. And as I was providing services, I showed up to work just to provide two hours of group counseling, and our floor staff called in sick. I ended up spending the whole day of the treatment working a double, on Saturday, and I did a double on Sunday. And then I went home to rest, to go back to work because I was supposed to provide transportation to a client to Moorhead for court. At 11.30, I received a phone call. One of our clients needed a ride to the emergency room because he has an abscess and he wants to go. I deemed it necessary to not call an ambulance and I went back and picked him up and take him to his appointment. As I sat in the parking lot, 11.45ish, spending two hours waiting for the client, I'm like, I'm reaching a breaking point. I'm tired, I cannot be there for my family. And then as the chair of the World Health and the, the um, disparities, I was very discouraged and I was ready to just take some stuff off my plate. As we had our meeting, I, I talked to our members and I, I wanted to take the pulse of the group and I'm like, how are you guys doing? And they all expressed how exhausted they were. So. I proposed to them, we need to take the pulse of the field. Hence the reason why um, we decided to send out the survey to collect data. Within a week, seven days, 670, 625 people took the survey, and 50% of them within the last 12 months consider leaving the field. This is alarming. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing it to your attention, and I drove 185 miles from Detroit to be here in person to just look at you in the eye and say, we need your help. Please support March's um, proposal by supporting the paperwork reduction, supporting the different pathway to uh, licensing, 
providing federal holidays for counselor, you are sending a positive message to our field that you get our back. So thank you. Thanks for driving down, and I'm glad we didn't cancel. I didn't know that somebody was driving down from. How's the Wee Fest up there, by the way? Have you ever, you know, any bands? It's crazy. The crazy. local don't really like it. How many thousands of people show up, and you know, it's like there it is. Um, yeah. Thanks for all your work in this. I mean, thank it, you. You know, when we truly really talk about different pathways to recovery, even out in the, out in the greater, greater twin, greater state of Minnesota, I appreciate your work that you're doing. Again, thank you for driving down here. So. Uh, members, any questions for Anderson St. George? None. Um, well, Mr. Chair. Senator. Well, this is actually, you know, the longer you sit in this committee, the more you just get, like, you've developed, a, I've developed a strong appreciation for people like this, um, Mr. St. George, and many others like him who I'll never get to meet, and I think you speak well on behalf of them. Thank you. Um, and the challenges, and, and even more to come, I'm afraid, you know, as... The ranks get thinner as the demand gets greater. Um, anyway, uh, we should just, if you see a person doing what he's doing, just make sure you tell him thank you and thank you. maybe I'm, buy him a cup of coffee or something. So, And, oh, and actually pass the bill. That would help, Mr. Chair. Yeah, we'll certainly need the coffee <laughs> to stay awake. So, so yeah, we'll you got, it. is Lance Egley going to, uh, you see, uh, on, on Zoom, Zoom yeah, land? Zoom. It's, go ahead, Lance. Are you there? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Hoffman, Assistant, uh, Bill Arthur Abler, and the other committee members. Uh, my name is Lance Egley, and I do happen to know Anderson, so I hope we'll pass the bill and keep him going, keep him alive. Um, I've completed a postdoc in the Organization and Financing of Mental Health Services at University of California, Berkeley. I've trained the staff in chemical health at Red Lake Nation for 19 years. I've coordinated the uh, chemical health minor at Bemidji State University, and I've spent the last six years working on paperwork reduction and systems improvement. I'm testifying today on the behalf of March concerning Senate File 3984, the part of it that refers to extending or bringing forward the deadline for the paperwork reduction and systems improvement uh, report from DHS to the legislature to the date of December 15, 2024. Uh, so far, we have several major accomplishments and some smaller ones. Uh, we've reduced the frequency with which treatment plans have to be reviewed so that the 50% that get reviewed without any changes can be reduced and that time devoted to the clients where it's needed. And we've reduced the report re frequency of utilization management reviews from 100% of cases to 10% of outpatient and 15% of residential. Uh, we've also got many of the uh, suggestions that we provided for direct access adopted. The existing legislation on paperwork reduction funded through the Department of Human Services requires the department contracting with a consultant this is an important component, and we expect major developments from this consultation. DHS has taken two, well, actually two and three quarters years to contract with this consultant required in the enabling legislation, a process that normally takes under six months. We simply can't rely on the Behavioral Health Division to bring material forward in a timely fashion to the legislature. The consultants finished their work June 30th, 2024. If we do not move the deadline forward, we will miss an entire legislative session, an entire year's session, before the legislative recommendations can be considered. The current DHS report deadline would be December 30th, 2025. We want it to move to December 15th, 2024. I would be happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments. Thank you. Thank you once again, Lance. Good. Always good to see you. Always good to hear from you. 19 years. You, the work you've done is just beyond, so I appreciate that. Senator Abler? Oh, is there any more? Anything else you want to say? No, no members, questions? questions? Right. I'll I just think have a closing thought then. Um, thought or comments? Thoughts short, comments are long. I'm kidding. <laughs> a long thought. I love no. that. <laughs> Um, you know, 
we've everybody in this room is if you collect all the years that in this industry between you know oversight and doing it and clients and all um, we have made this a really complicated business and at the end of the day there's a lot of common sense that we just don't get to do because of you know we, we want to make sure the money is well spent and the right clinician doing the right things but you know part of this bill is a paperwork reduction thing and we're what, what is this three years ago we passed the simplification program and in the meantime we're running the st george's out of business just from uh you know and, and so I, I don't know it's just i'm hope we can hope there can be something to this in the education world of special ed paperwork not enough teachers not enough counselors not enough We've got plenty of clients i guess but um so it's it's it, we have to remember the good we do for those who do get served, and there's a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and I just want, hope that the people watching at home that do this, like Mr. St. George is here, uh, feel that we we kind of get it, and we're grateful for their efforts at succeeding. And the purpose of these two bills is to try to make it somewhat easier for them to accomplish their work, get the most out of the least, and um, rescue some of these people from the abyss. This is not just they're going to get a little better linoleum in their kitchen. This is they're going to be alive. They're going to be supporting their family. They're going to become independent. So yep. that's my thought, Mr. Chair. Thank you. No, Mr. Chair I, and Senator Abler, thank you for taking your lead and continually take the lead on these because it's, it's a complicated system. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's, you know, we want to save some lives and we want to make sure we're doing what we're doing. So, members, it looks like we're going to lay this one over for possible inclusion in the omnibus mm -hmm. bill. So uh, with that, thank you, Brian and, and team, for being here. You guys might as well just stay there. Senator Abler, you got Senate File 4276. A couple of things. We are going to get done on time. I'm so happy we can do that. And, and uh, at 5 o'clock, it looks like the Senate will reconvene at 5 p.m. to receive messages from the House. So if you, you know, anybody want to go over there... You know, we can go receive those messages. So that's just a limited need, right? Yeah, just a limited. Looks at it says only a few members needed to return to the chamber when the Senate adjourns. It will do so <sighs> until Wednesday, March thirteenth at eleven a.m. Got that, members? So, and also just to let you know, I I continue my closing. Senator Abler, on we'll have this room late Wednesday if we need if we need it Wednesday late. Um, uh, that on three thirteen if necessary. And we just, I think Already. we got all our bills too. So Senator Abler, Senate file 4276. And Mr. Chair, there are different testifiers for this one. So we, uh, we tried to confuse you all. Thank you. You right. sure did. I see um, you got there's Tim an Walsh amendment, coming Mr. up, Chair, but he's not listed on my, on my uh, agenda. So I don't know. Sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh-oh. Turn him away. Sorry. Yeah. Mr. Chair, there's some members of the public who wish to testify in addition to those listed on the agenda. Tim, you want to just make sure that you sign in, you fold, so we'll we can do. get you for the record. So, uh, you got anybody else there, Dr. Walsh, that's joining you at all? Yes. Gina, yes. is she coming Gina's up too? Coming oh, up. Yes. God, it, all right. Yeah. Senator Abler, it's your bill. Senate File 4276. No amendments. You got? Or do uh, you I do one? have an amendment, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, and uh, it's the A1, and uh, if you look at the timestamps on some of these. Um, uh, Mr. Monahan's been just uh, really pushing up to the end on some of these, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, it's uh, it does delete on line 1.26. It does delete the word and, and also on line 1.27 uh, inserts the word and. So other highlights to the amendment, but those are the ones that jump out at me, Mr. Chair. So thank you. And with that, Senator Abler, the bill's yours. We have to vote on it. There you go, Mr. Chair. I'll move the A1. Uh, members, A1 amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you, Senator Abler. The bill is in the form that you like it. So, Mr. Chair, in an effort to keep us on time, I'm going to just point out that this is a highly valuable bill and will indeed make this industry somewhat better. And actually, if we pass the bill, it's going to cost a ton of money, but it's going to be a way stronger industry. So, there you go. Great. Who's going first? Dr. Walsh? Do you want to go first? Or Brian, you want to go? Zervis, you want to? read the section. Go ahead, just jump into it. You do everything. Okay. What do you want to do? All right. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to give a brief overview of the sections. And Mr. Zervis, go ahead. Just for the record, so we know it's a new bill, you want to state your name. And yep, we will do. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Brian Zervis with March. Uh, so, Senate File 4276, Sections 1, 2, and 3 is regarding waiving fees for identifications, uh, ID cards, driver's licenses, and um, birth certificates. 
Sections four and five would be uh, language regarding developing a group peer rate and setting a ratio. Section six is substance disorder treatment effectiveness. I would direct the commissioner to work with stakeholders on SUD data uh, and then provide that data um, uh, to providers. Section seven would be re-including substance disorder in a 3% rate increase for, that happened last session. That also includes an automatic inflation adjustment. Section eight is extending the rate study um, for the uh, outpatient rate study that uh, was just presented to this committee in January. Uh, there are some parts of the SUD continuum that were not included. Uh, so specifically looking at identifying a rate for adolescent, residential, non-residential, adolescent withdrawal management, and also identifying a cost-based rate for room and board. Section nine is touching on the re-entry waiver, uh, having the application deadline be January 2025. And then the last piece is the transition support work group, which would be identifying um, various barriers that uh, clients experience as they move to and from treatment regarding uh, housing, transportation, food assistance, et cetera. Uh, so having this work group uh, look at and identify barriers and bring forth recommendations for a subsequent legislative session. That's it for my testimony, Mr. Chair. Mr. Jibis, uh, Senator Ailey, we're going next to Dr. Tim Walsh, right? Yes. Thank you. Yes. For the Thank record. You, Senator Hoffman, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, Senators, we just want to draw your attention to Section 7. Uh, last year, uh, we were left out of, inexplicably left out of the increase for mental health. There was a 3% uh, rate increase, and there was an automatic inflator. And you know, here we are testifying on overdoses and increases in, in the acuity of mental health issues with our, with our clients, uh, people in desperate circumstances, uh, a workforce shortage and crisis. Uh, and, and we were left out and there, there's no explanation for it and we we're just hoping for a, a correction to that uh, injustice and I just wanted to draw some attention to some of the facts and figures that uh, both uh, Mr. Zervis uh, and others are going to uh, talk about briefly. Um, first of all, with the rate study, the rate methodology study, it's, it's uh, on average increasing, uh, it increased the rates by 68% to keep up with costs, 68%. Uh, that gives you a sense of, of how desperate things are for us right now. Uh, we've had a 3% increase to our base rate in 13 years. So 3% over 13 years. Uh, and, and what was the rate of inflation? About 5% this year. Uh, Mr. Zervis testified, you know, on average, we're losing two programs per month. Uh, they're going out of business. And we, we have 417 and it's 45 over two years. We serve 60,000 people. That's been increasing. We're uh, over 60,000 people that we're serving in our system. That's only about 10% of the people that do need treatment in the state of Minnesota. We're trying to increase access. We're trying to eliminate uh, unnecessary barriers for people to getting into treatment. And so we have to have the means uh, in order to do that. I, I, I like uh, what Anderson said about being at a breaking point. Uh, we're, we're not here asking for an expansion of anything. We're not asking for additional funding for additional services. We're talking about sustainability here. We're talking about survivability of people in our field. Uh, it's, it happens that if we can go, we, if we go without a couple of payments, we can be insolvent within a matter of weeks. And that's what's going on in our field right now. And so I, we just want to ask for that we uh, correct what uh, we believe should have happened last year, which is uh, including us within the mental health uh, increase. We, we are part of the behavioral health system. We, are part, we do integrated behavioral health. We provide mental health services. We provide co-occurring treatment. And uh, we're saying that that was unjust to be excluded in the first place. So that's our request today. Oh, thank you, doctor. Any questions for the good doctor? You have, uh, is Lance going to also talk about, no, it's just, this is it? Gina. Anybody else? Oh, Gina and, come Gina. on up. Gina. Please uh, sign in too if those folks that are, we don't have, because David didn't have your names down. So if you could also sign in, Gina, maybe, or just send an email to David. Um, but go ahead for the record. Who wants to go first? I will. Um, 
Chair and members of the committee, my name is Gina Evans and I serve as Chair of the Government Affairs Committee for March and in Legislative Affairs for Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this crucial piece of legislation and thank you to the authors who have worked tire tirelessly to get it right. <laughs> According to the Minnesota Department of Health in 2018, Minnesota lost 342 daughters, sons, husbands, and mothers to opioid use disorder. Just five short years later in 2022, that number has nearly tripled to over 1,000, an increase of 292%. These numbers are tragic and these families are forever changed. I don't have to tell this body that humans are our greatest resource. As Brian mentioned, the survey of over 620 substance use disorder workers, 50% of them are experiencing burnout. Minnesota is not alone in this. Nationally, the US is experiencing a behavioral health workforce crisis. Strategies like increases to reimbursement rates, automatic inflation adjustments, and student loan relief are just some of the ways other states are battling back. Um, I'm not only an employee of Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge, but also a byproduct of the great evidence-based trauma-informed care that programs across our great state are um, that pride themselves on. But this kind of care comes at a cost. MNTC provides annual cost of living raises to all of our employees, but if reimbursement rates don't align, this is obviously not a sustainable business model. In 2023, SUD programs were less left out of the rate increases that many other direct care industries received. We are asking this legislature, in light of recent program closures and the continued rise in overdose deaths, um, to provide the SUD field a rate increase this year so that we can continue to help Minnesotans that struggle with substance use find the best version of themselves. Um, that was what I had um, on my paper. You get two minutes in the house. They're not playing around. Um, Representative Fisher like has a timer. Um, the other thing that I would just ask you guys, the 1115 reentry waiver is something that um, other states um, on both sides of the aisle are looking at nationally to ensure that um, folks that are uh, reentering uh, community out of uh, correct carceral settings um, are insured pre-release. Um, and it and it's. It, it's work, it works, um, getting folks, it's warm handoffs to programs, it's warm handoffs um, into healthcare, whether that's MATs or any other kind of treatment or medical care, and I would just encourage you, um, Minnesota, we, we wanna study it for, through the next legislative session, like Lance was talking about, which would make it like 2026 before we'd be able to act on it, and so we would just ask um, to study quickly and so that we could get um, it signed um, next session. So thank um, you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for testifying here. And, and um, it's a rule in the Senate that you refer to the other body as the other body. You never say the name of that oh, place. No. Sorry. So, you know, that's okay. Those people. Those people. Sorry. The, the other body. You can the, say the body of which we do Peter not Fisher's speak. Name all day long, but, but you can't. Right? Am I correct on that, Counselor? You want the body of which do, we do not speak. That's good. <laughs> I, got, I got the lawyer staying out of it. Am I right? Oh wait, you served in the other body. I can't. I better be. Oh, both you guys did. Holy God, I'm in trouble. So did she. So did he. All right, I take back what I said. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your work. I've I've known the work that you've done. Especially um, lots of people uh, there, so thank you for you doing that. So Thanks, Senator please Hoffman. tell us uh, your name and, and. Hello, my name is uh, Dr. R. John Sutherland or Roy John Sutherland. I'm a licensed psychologist, a licensed alcohol drug counselor, vice president of addiction services for Nystrom's and Associates, and the co chair of the Government Affairs Committee for March. I want to thank you, Chair Hoffman, and committee members for letting me speak today. In order to provide SUD services, there are several factors that impact our businesses and or programs to operate. One is volumes, two are reimbursements, and then three, of course, are fixed expenses, largely made up of labor costs, about 75%. In order to cover these fixed expenses, we have to do a couple of things. Number one, we can cut expenses 
which for most of us, we're pretty lean. Number two, we can increase volumes. Well, increasing volumes, that may not occur because A, we have ratios that are basically set by DHS, as well as by increasing them, we're only gonna create more burnout and providers will lead the field and programming likely won't take with, with our patients as well as, as it would now. Number three, we can increase our rate reimbursements. As noted, the current reimbursement rates are barely covering our fixed expenses. It's causing a lot of programs to close, it's creating a lot of stress, and as a, as a provider who cares deeply about creating access, our access uh, problem right now has become a crisis. There's just definitely not enough access for the amount of people that are needing services. So I'm asking this body, I'm a constituent, to vote to reinstate the 3% rate reimbursement rate for, uh, along with the inflation, um, for, um, SUDC, uh, for SUD that was striked out of the behavioral health bill last year. In addition, we do need long-term overhaul of our reimbursement rates as recommended by our outside independent consultants who study the rate increases needed to cover our operating expenses. If we don't act quickly, more programs are gonna close resulting in increase in, in substance use and mental health problems and a restriction of access. I have to say, I've been in the field for almost 20 years we're not going into a crisis. We are in a crisis. This is something that we have to take care of right now. Otherwise, this could result in a lot more deaths, providers leaving the field because they're burnt out. We need your help. I appreciate your time and your um, willingness to listen. Thank you. Thank you, doctor. Thank you for all your work. So, um, members, any questions? Senator Atke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just uh, actually for a little bit of, uh, of a history lesson, and maybe Senator Abler can help us with this. I, when I see the uh, birth records, basically birth certificates, uh, the ID cards, driver's licenses, we've had these on pass bills that yeah. in previous years. They just never made it across the finish line? Senator Abler. I don't think so. Some people need a career thing to work on, so I guess that's it. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think it did, no. No, I think we talked about it. I mean, this committee, we've talked, we've had this discussion about the we fact that you can't get a birth certificate, and every time you go back, if you don't have it, I mean, there were so many, thank you, Gina just held up her finger three times. So we've had these discussions. I don't think we've ever had it actually in a, in a bill, now that you mention it. I don't know. Well, yeah. there was a hearing last year or two years ago in state government or somewhere. Transportation, I don't know, it's somewhere. Well, I'm glad. So, so, so to that point that Senator Recky's on, Senator Abler, is this, this thing got, last year, it was between the, the jurisdiction between the Health and Human Services Committee and this one, and it just kind of, what, what's up this year? This one this? gets to go to both, so we're going to mail it off there, I think. Okay. Um, so, but anyway, Mr. Chair, the, and you're kind of running low on And I want to go back to Senator Recky, I didn't mean to jump in there, but is there, did you have a follow-up or... No, um, not really. It's just, I mean, those are minor little costs that are part of this, um, but then you get into the rest of it. I would imagine there's a fiscal note coming and uh, there's a lot of possible expense. But, Mr. Chair, you get to figure out how to shoehorn that into your budget. <clears throat> oh, now, now it becomes me. I thought this was a team effort up here. I don't know why it's just... Uh, there's no I in team, Mr. There's no Chair. I in team. Senator Abler, I don't know. I, You know, we told Matt... Matt uh, Burdick at the beginning of the session, right? He's like, you know, can you guys, the fiscal note stuff, you know, make sure now, I don't know, how many fiscal notes do you have into them now? Mr. Chair, one? I just want to point out for the committee while we kind of wrap up here on page yep. 13, lines 16 to 23, um, the direction of the commissioner, which I don't see as a problem uh, from all the people back there in this department, uh, to adopt the rate study proposed rates. Um, that's a simple paragraph of maybe eight lines that probably costs hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. So, um, but that would be helpful. 
But so my suggestion, maybe, Mr. Chair, if I can, to the promoters of this bill, and I'm a huge fan of what they're trying to do, is to help divide out the stuff that's free or really, really, really cheap. Yep. And the big stuff will run its course. Uh, this is not a, I mean, everybody knows it's not a budget, but the fact that Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Chair, um, the fact that it's not a budget year doesn't mean that the people who are experiencing burnout and a crisis as the providers and the people as the clients and the families of the clients and the mothers and daughters of all that while they watch their loved one just uh, yeah. collapse around them because of inability to find people who are willing to drive 40 miles to take them to the ER. You know, Mr. Chair, I just, I've heard many much testimony and I'm just forever impressed again by the caliber of people that choose to do this work. So nice. That's all I got, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Abler, any, uh, anybody else? Senator Abler, uh, as amended, Senate File 4276. Senator Abler moves, uh, be recommended to pass and re-referred to the Health and Human Services Committee. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. That is, there you go, off and running. We've got a few stops. Am I missing anything else? I already said we're, if needed, on Wednesday. We'll go late. Um, so we should be good to go and... Go to the floor if you guys want. With that, we are adjourned. I'll try to get this one to the floor.